Good morning, everybody. It's um, an honor to have been invited to come and speak to this forum. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about the practice of uh, technology journalism and covering technology journalism and saying, explaining why I think it's very important um, and how it's become more important and um, where it's going. Um, so what I do is I am the business editor at The Economist and I also um, run our technology quarterly supplement which um, covers emerging technologies of all kinds. Um, and that means that all of the business and the technology coverage at The Economist goes across my desk and through my brain. Um, if you're not familiar with The Economist, it's a global news weekly. Um, the idea is that if there was only one magazine you could have sent to you on a desert island, uh, that you would choose The Economist because it would have everything you needed to know about the world every week. Um, we had 1.4 million uh, circulation, and most of our readers are in North America uh, and, uh, and in Europe. But uh, some of them are in uh, this part of the world, but not that many. While I'm a technology journalist, um, I think it's important to uh, say why I, you know, what inspires me, and I suspect what inspires many other technology journalists. I'm essentially interested in the future and what it might look like. And the best way to see that is to be a technology journalist, as William Gibson, the science fiction writer, once put it. The future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And if you um, get to go to the parts of the world where the future is already visible, um, you can start to imagine what the, uh, what the future in general will look like. Another good thing about being a technology journalist is it's a continuation of my education. I'm able to speak to the world's cleverest people um, about the newest things that are happening, and that's, um, it never ceases to uh, excite me. Um, so uh, that's really why I do it, and I think why a lot of people in this field do it. So what I'm going to talk about now is how the practice of technology journalism has, has changed, and how we do it at The Economist, and where I think it's going. Essentially, I think there have been two big stories in the past 15 years that have made technology journalism much more important and much more prominent. They are the rise of the internet and the spread of mobile phones, and both of those are, of course, outgrowths of the digitalization of everything, the rise of the microprocessor and so on. Um, essentially, technology was a job. Technology in newspapers and in magazines was a, uh, a small subject. You had a, a page where, perhaps once a week, the newest inventions would appear, and occasionally you might have a story uh, about some uh, some new robot that had been invented, or a, a new kind of camera, or whatever. I mean, it, it really was um, an obscure part of, of coverage, I think, for many years. I remember when I was at the Daily Telegraph many years ago, we had a page called Innovations, and that was where all the technology coverage for the week went. Um, since then, the internet has changed things dramatically. Is it working? Okay. Since then, the internet has changed things dramatically. Um, it has changed every aspect of, of, uh, of life. It's changed politics, it's changed business, it's changed the way that people um, interact socially. It's changed journalism too, and that's the subject of the next session. Um, but the main thing it's done is it's meant that um, computers, which were previously really something just for enthusiasts, are now useful to everyone. Um, people who had no reason to have a computer before, have a reason, which is to use the internet. And this created a uh, huge demand for people to explain what was going on in the past decade. Uh, when we polled economist readers, they consistently said that the thing they wanted to hear more about was coverage of the impact of the internet on business. Um, so there were, this was something that people really wanted to know about, and it was in fact my route into journalism in 1994. Um, I, heard about the internet in this magazine called Wired. I bought the first issue when it came out. I thought, this looks interesting. And there weren't very many people in Britain at the time who were using the internet, and there was a, uh, a gap at newspapers for people who could write about it, and so that was why I was able to get started. Essentially, then, what happened in the past 15 years or so since I started doing this, and the internet happened over that same period, is that tech journalists went from writing about gadgets, to being expected to comment on all sorts of things. Um, the internet, because it has touched every aspect of, of life, um, 
and has changed many of them and shaken them up. Um, technology journalists now have to know about all these other things, um, privacy, censorship, telecoms, regulation, competition policy, intellectual property. Um, so it's become a rather more uh, complex endeavor to cover technology than it was before. Now, clearly what's happened is many of the early debates that the internet got started have been resolved. Uh, in 1995, some American activists tried to declare independence for cyberspace. It was a joke, really, but their idea was that the internet was a new start, rather like the United States of America was a new start. and You didn't need to have the same rules online as you had in the real world. Well, ultimately, that has failed. We do have national laws applied to the internet, and we have compromises in most areas. If somebody sells you something on eBay and they don't, it doesn't show up, you know, we know what the process to resolve that is now. Um, so, a lot of the sort of early idealism has, uh, has evaporated and has been replaced with, with pragmatism. But as that process unfolded, Journalists helped to frame the debate and influence the outcome. And um, I'm not saying that they played in, you know, they, they determined the, the, uh, the policies that were eventually implemented, but just by explaining what was going on, journalists play a very important part in that debate. Um, I remember <coughs> early in my career, there was some controversy about things being posted on the internet in Britain. And a, uh, a senior politician asked why the internet couldn't just be turned off. Um, I don't think anyone still thinks that the internet is some machine in a room that could be turned off. I don't think people think that anymore. Another um, very widespread misconception in the early days of the internet was a, a, an inability to distinguish between the content um, that was put up by users and the companies that were delivering that content to other people. So if I logged onto the internet and saw somebody saying something rude about me, um, who would I sue? Would I blame my internet provider? Would I blame their internet provider? Although we know, we understand now that you, the person that you blame is the person who has posted this. Um, and you have to get used to uh, much more expression on the internet. But um, you can't really hold the providers of the pipes responsible for what flows through the pipes. Um, and again, this was something that uh, people really didn't understand in the old days. They really thought that when you bought internet access from a company, they were standing behind everything that came down that pipe. And of course they're not. It's not like being a broadcaster. Um, of course, there are still many debates that are unresolved about the internet. Uh, there's a rather boring one about net neutrality. Um, and everyone has a different definition of net neutrality, so I don't think that one will ever go away. Um, there's a question about something called behavioural targeting, which is a way of targeting advertising and um, has its defenders and its critics. Um, and then uh, something we're hearing a lot about is Google Earth and the use of, uh, of Google Earth by terrorists, say. They look up the, um, the shape of a compound uh, on Google Earth and is this Google's fault? Um, this is very similar to the early debates, I think, about, um, about the internet. Of course it's not Google's fault if they provide high-resolution images of things. Um, and uh, those images do a lot more good than harm. Um, my favourite example of this is the alarm clock. Um, you can, if you want to, build a bomb and use the alarm clock to uh, make it go off. Does this mean that we can ban alarm clocks? Um, well, most alarm clocks are not used to make bombs go off. And um, so this is the sort of uh, analogy, I think, that needs to be uh, pointed out more often. Similarly, bad people use electricity and mobile phones. Does that mean they should be banned? No. So I think there is still work to be done explaining um, these sorts of things. And uh, we are the people to do it. Um, spread of mobile phones is the other really big technology story of the past 15 years, and it's affected far more people than the rise of the internet. Um, about half of the world's population now has a mobile phone. And the really important thing about them is that the internet um, generally supplemented other forms of communication. In the rich world, we already had fixed line phones before the internet came along. Um, 
Mobile phones, by contrast, are often providing access to communications for the first time, uh, particularly across the developing world. And that has far greater impact um, because it puts people on the communications grid. And so I have argued consistently in The Economist that the real digital divide, the digital divide we hear a lot about, is usually defined to be the fact that most people in the world don't have access to the internet through a PC. Um, but I think the really important um, divide is access to communications in general, and the phone is the, uh, is the main way that's being extended. So here is a boy in Africa who has a phone made out of mud. Um, this is what he aspires to, having a phone. Africa is now the fastest growing region for the spread of mobile phones. Um, the reason this is such a big story is because of the direct economic impact of the, of the phones. They substitute for poor infrastructure, so they can save you a wasted journey, um, or make up for the fact that there's no postal service. Um, so there's, as example, the shopkeeper in Afghanistan, when he goes into, he's out, out of the country, when he goes to Kabul to buy supplies for his shop, um, anyone who goes to his shop will find that it's closed, and they will have wasted their journey. Um, but if they text it first, they can find out whether he's going to be there or not. Um, another good thing is price discovery and market access. The classic example there is fishermen in Kerala, um, and uh, essentially they they catch their fish off the coast, and they then call markets along the coast to see which markets are still in need of fish, because if they drive to a market and all the customers have already bought fish, they won't be able to sell them, and it will be too late to drive to another market, to go down the coast to another market, before the fish spoil. Um, so there's a lovely uh, natural experiment that's been conducted in Kerala where the extension of mobile phone coverage has led to a, a fall in the price of fish, a reduction in the wastage of fish, and an increased uh, profitability for the fishermen. So everybody wins, and that's the sort of thing that extending communication does. Um, and there are some very exciting new things that um, mobile phones are doing with mobile banking and uh, money transfer and so on. And the uh, poster child there is an Visa in Kenya. Um, and it's very interesting that this is a technology where the developing world is far ahead of the developed world. Almost nobody does this sort of thing with phones um, in the West. And uh, in fact, we could learn a great deal from the experience that uh, Visa has in Africa. Here's the... Um, my favorite statistic on this, which we published first in The Economist in 2005, an extra 10 mobile phones per 100 people in a typical developing country leads to an extra 0.6 percentage points in GDP growth. And uh, this is a favorite statistic of Bill Clinton. He loves to quote this one. Um, but that sort of puts in black and white what a lot of anecdotes also support. Um, well, why does this, uh, what does this mean for tech journalism? Well, this is again a field where um, I think it's very important that the issues and the arguments are well explained. Um, all governments claim that they are in favour of growth and in favour of connectivity, but many governments have policies um, that actually uh, prevent the spread of these technologies or don't do everything that they could to encourage it. And uh, mobile phones are a very good example of this. Um, governments don't really have to do anything for mobile phone networks to appear in their countries. Um, private firms will build them if they're allowed to. And there's this great figure from the World Bank, $230 billion was put into telecoms infrastructure in the developing world in the decade from 1993, and even more will have gone in since then. These are not the usual big Western firms, the usual suspects. An awful lot of those companies were uh, afraid of doing business in Africa uh, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, and so local champions have, have popped up instead. Um, and the key to all of this is deregulation and issuing licenses so that competitive operators can enter the market. Um, if you consider Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, both have about the same GDP per capita, it's about $100 a month, I think. Um, the DRC has a mobile phone penetration of 10.5%, and Ethiopia has a mobile phone penetration of about 1.5%. And why is there this difference? Because it's not that the people in the DRC are richer, 
And it's simply because there are four operators competing in the DRC, and there is only one, the government monopoly, in Ethiopia. And um, it's very badly run. They ration the SIM cards. There are riots when they issue new ones. It's hopeless. And um, if you allow competition, you will get uh, more investment in infrastructure, and you will get lower prices, and you will get greater adoption. Um, and perhaps the best example of this is Somalia, where there is no government to speak of, and the mobile phone penetration is 7%, far higher than in Ethiopia. So actually, that shows you, I think, that the government can get in the way here. Um, in Somalia, the operators even got together and formed their own regulator, because they needed to control the uh, allocation of the spectrum, and there was no government to do it. So I think that shows you that um, uh, the wrong government policy can actually be worse than not having a government at all when it comes to promoting the spread of communications technology. Many governments in um, developing countries have also imposed luxury taxes on handsets. Ethiopia has done that. And this is the idea that since only the rich can afford mobile phones, a good way to tax the rich is to tax mobile phones. This becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it then means that poorer people can't afford them. Um, but if you actually encourage the spread of mobile telecoms, it can be a big contributor to government taxes. And in fact, it's the largest contributor in many developing countries. It's 14% of tax revenues in Afghanistan. So done right, mobile telecoms can drive the economy, can benefit the government, um, can benefit people. Um, it's all a matter of getting it right. Now, unlike with the internet, there is not a thirst to have this explained. So people were coming to us at The Economist and going to newspapers and saying, we don't understand the internet, please explain it to us. Um, in this case, this is a, um, with mobile phones, this is something I think <coughs> needs better explanation. Um, and uh, sometimes people aren't asking things to be explained to them, but it's very important that they are. Um, and it's a case where technology overlaps with economics, with regulation, with development, and I think reporting it accurately is, is more vital than ever. So those two, um, those two examples, I think, show you how, the, uh, how technology journalism has become much more important than it used to be. It's no longer just writing about new gadgets. It really does touch on issues of, um, of global importance, and it's very important that we get it right. So I'm going to um, go over quickly how we do things at The Economist. Um, I'm not saying that we get everything right, and I'm not saying that all publications should do it the way we do it, but um, people do seem to like the way we do it. When I speak to scientists and technologists and say, I'm from The Economist and I want to write up your work, they're often very pleased and they, uh, they're very keen to talk to us, partly because we get it right and we explain things properly. Um, very often, it's because our explanation allows them to show their friends and their family what they do. We explain what they do in uh, terms that can be understood, um, and uh, very often they like that. Um, and also, uh, we keep them up to date with developments in other fields. There are so many fields of science and technology now that it's very difficult to keep track. We provide the service of looking across all these uh, developments and saying to people, this is what we think is really important. So essentially, I think we try and do three things with our coverage. We try to be broad, um, and we try to place things in context. We try to be deep, and we try to do things in a more detailed way, and we try to be a filter. Um, so being broad, essentially, we, we try to look around the story, provide an overview of the field, look into other industries, and do international historical comparisons. And the idea in all of these cases is to avoid hype, and to avoid the idea that the um, whatever the new thing is, is, is going to save the world or change everything, fix all sorts of problems. I think if, uh, it's much more credible if you, um, if you put things in context. Um, so, for example, what other companies are doing such and such, um, whatever new thing it is, um, how long has the idea been around, what is new? If you've covered technology for a number of years, you'll see the same stories coming around and around, but it's always such and such is going to be the next big thing. Um, there are lots of technologies that um, have struggled to get off the ground, and maybe they will eventually. One technologist once said, it takes 15 years to have an overnight success. Um, and I've certainly seen 
some technologies like biometrics or fuel cells um, have been about to take off for, for years and not really done so. Video conferencing is another example. People are always saying, yes, it's being much more widely adopted. And now maybe it is, but it's taken a long time. So I think uh, when presented with a piece of news from one company doing one of these things, it's very important to look at how many other people are doing it, how long they have, and what's really going on. It's also very useful to, I think, compare industries. Um, it's very interesting to compare how clean technology is developing now and how that compares with the dot com boom from seven or eight years ago. Um, airlines and telecoms have a lot in common, they're both networks, and uh, you've got low cost airlines and you have low cost telecoms, people have tried it. Um, so I'm very interested in these sorts of comparisons between industries, and I think they can help you to evaluate whether a new technology is really important or not. I'm also very interested in international comparisons. This is something we specialize in at The Economist. So those examples I just gave you about mobile phones, you can understand how these things work and what's going on much more easily if you compare the situation in one country with the situation in another. And if a new policy is introduced and um, the government says, this is going to do this, that, or the other, you can say, well, is that true? How has this worked in other countries that have tried this policy? And so forth. So we're very keen on, on this sort of uh, cross-border comparison at The Economist. Um, for example, how did uh, 3G work in Japan? They were the first country to have 3G, and I went there, and uh, nobody at all was using the video telephony feature on the phones. And it was obvious that no one was going to use it. And now lots of us have these 3G phones, and almost nobody uses the video telephony feature. Um, so it's one of these examples of a, being able to see the future in a particular part of the world. Um, broadband in South Korea is another example. The government made it cheap and everyone adopted it. And that told you that the only reason they weren't adopting it in other countries was that it was expensive, not because there weren't new applications that had to be invented. They came along later. So these sorts of comparisons can be very helpful. And my favorite example of comparisons for evaluating the value of a new technology is um, historical analogies. Um, and the one I'm most associated with is that between the telegraph of the 19th century and the internet at the end of the 20th century. Um, all sorts of claims were made about the telegraph when uh, the network was built in the uh, 1850s to the 1870s. People said it would lead to world peace, and um, there were hackers, and there were online romances, and there were all sorts of things that have subsequently happened on the internet. And that, I think, um, provides a very useful set of tools for evaluating claims that the internet will, say, lead to world peace. I don't think it will. Um, when it comes to the depth of our coverage, essentially we try to go one level deeper than other news organizations. Uh, we think our readers have an appetite for an extra level of detail and that it can be provided without having to use more complex language. Um, so this is the sort of, uh, the example of a paragraph about how lithium ion batteries work. Um, I'm not going to read it out, but going in, I think, and, and uh, fine tuning this paragraph that explains the detail of the technology is one of the most enjoyable parts of technology journalism. And um, a big part of it, I think, is finding the right analogy um, to simplify something in a way that helps people understand it, but does not offend experts in the field. And very often, the way to find that analogy is to actually discuss it with the experts themselves. Um, here's a very nice example from the world of mobile phones, which I cooked up with Roberto Padovani of Qualcomm. So there are three main ways you can sprinkle uh, mobile phone calls through the air, and um, one of them is rather like uh, people at a, at a party taking turns to talk, Another is like people speaking at different pitches, so you can um, distinguish different speakers. And another is like speaking different languages. Um, and that's the technology that we're all using today, that's used in 3G. Um, another thing we do is we boffinize stories, which means we send them to the experts, um, or at least we send the paragraphs of explanation to check that they're accurate. And this is good because more accuracy means that people are more prepared to talk to us in the future. And um, when boffins start to try and steer 
our coverage and if we're, if we're critical of a particular approach and they think that's unfair, um, we are, of course we have the right to ignore their comments if we choose. So we are not giving them approval over our copy, we are merely asking for their comments and I think that can be very helpful in, um, in technological uh, explanations. But I think one of the most important things we do is to ignore stories. Um, some things just aren't important. Um, there are very often stories in the newspaper about a, a miracle cure for something uh, or a new breakthrough in the treatment for, for cancer or something like that. Um, these, these things very rarely pan out and I think they're misleading. They can make individual journalists look good to their editors, um, but in the long run I think they undermine your credibility. So very often not covering them is a service to your readers and that's what we do. Another form of filtering is deciding, given the enormous level of uh, spending on, on public relations in technology, what's really important. And um, when PR firms put a company forward to talk about a particular thing, um, you really have to be able to decide whether they are the, the best qualified company or really the most accessible. And good PRs, I find, will admit that their clients actually have rivals. And they will, uh, we, we tend to cover fields rather than companies. So we, instead of writing about a company that makes fuel cells, we will write about the field of fuel cells. And that will involve several companies. And um, good PRs will be prepared to accept that and say, yes, the other people in this field are these people. And uh, will we'll accept that um, they will have to be mentioned as well. Um, and the other way we filter is just by running very few stories. The ones that are vital, not necessarily the ones that are urgent. So we have to be able to decide what's really important. And the funny thing is, when we ask people if they want more technology coverage, whether they want the tech company to be longer, they say no. And it's because they want us to be the filter and to keep the amount that they have to read down to a sensible level. So where is technology journalism going now? The interesting thing is, something changed in 2006. Our readers who had previously, when we polled them about what they wanted from our technology coverage, instead of saying they wanted more about the internet, they started saying they wanted more about clean technology, energy technology. Um, and we saw this coming, um, not least because when the economy started in the 1840s, we incorporated something called the Railway Monitor. This was a, a publication that covered the railways um, in Britain, and they were the dot-com technology of the time. There was a huge investment bubble and a huge crash. And um, we no longer incorporate the railway monitor of the economy. And this is because um, technology fashions change. There are railways all over the place in, uh, in Britain still, but we don't write about them very often. And the internet is, is becoming a part of the infrastructure, like the railways, that we will use every day, but will become invisible and we will only notice it when it stops working. So energy is clearly the next big story in tech journalism. Um, it's the biggest story um, in technology journalism history, I think, because fixing climate change is a tech story. Um, this is a, a view of what's happening um, uh, from a, a rather amusing and cynical venture capitalist writing in Harper's Magazine and he says each bubble needs to be bigger than the last one in order to absorb the losses of the last one. Um, so he predicts that the next bubble will be an alternative energy and will peak in around 2013. I think that's probably a, a fair bet. Um, and there will be a big crash, but what we know from the, um, the internet is that um, it's after that crash that the technology really starts to be adopted properly. Anyway, what this means is that the definition of technology which has prevailed for the past 10 years, the tech industry meant the computing and telecoms industry. Um, that, that's no longer true. Um, so technology journalists need to start learning if they haven't done so already about batteries and fuel cells and solar panels and ethanol and all these other forms of technology. And this is what I've been doing for the past five years or so. Um, and it's all fascinating stuff. Um, so I think technology journalists need to uh, be ready for all this stuff that's coming. Um, the fight against climate change will involve lots of different technologies. There's no silver bullet, there's no single answer. There will be a portfolio of technologies. This is called the all of the above solution. So we need to know about all of them 
and we need to be um, familiar with them so we can explain them to our readers. Um, there are lots of, again, just as with the adoption of mobile phones and the internet, there are lots of um, regulatory debates that I think technology journalists have an important role in uh, clarifying and helping to explain. Um, pack and trade versus carbon tax as a means of uh, holding down emissions. Um, the debate over biofuels, whether it's possible to produce biofuels without impacting the food supply. Um, the correct way to subsidize clean technologies. Why is it that the country with the most solar panels in the world is Germany, which is very often highly. It's because of uh, subsidies. Um, genetically modified crops, very controversial in Europe, but I think probably have a very important role to play in uh, maintaining food production as the climate changes. And something that's really come up the agenda in the past six months or so is geoengineering. And this is enormous engineering projects that try to um, change the climate, but in a good way, back to the way it was before. Um, this is hugely controversial, and it's an overlap between technology and regulation. Plenty of explaining to do then, plenty of work for technology journalists. And I think biotechnology will be part of the uh, climate change solution. Um, I think uh, GM crops, there was a paper this week about changing the color of the leaves so that crops that are growing reflect more light back into space. This could have an enormous um, uh, impact on, the, on climate change on its own. Um, and there is also talk of producing hydrogen and ethanol from artificial life forms. Um, so biotechnology is also something that technology journalists need to, uh, need to get their heads around. And the good news, I think, for tech journalists who, like me, have grown up writing about computing and studied computing and so on, is that actually both of these new fields rely heavily on the foundation of information technology. And information technology will underpin um, the revolutions in clean technology and biotechnology. And that's because with clean technology you need, um, you need to do things like build solar cells out of silicon, and you need to have smart grids, and you need to have a lot of software to decide how your electric car is going to charge and so forth. And similarly, biotechnology um, has become heavily reliant on databases to analyze DNA, um, personalized medicine, and so on. So technology journalists who um, I think have been covering what's happened in the past 10 years have a head start on this sort of thing. Overall, I'm an optimist about the future. I think if we as technology journalists do our jobs right, we can help make the world a better place, help explain things, help ensure that the right policies are implemented and that technology can have the greatest possible benefit for the greatest number of people. So um, I'm looking forward to the future and I hope to see you there. Thank you for listening. penetration is approximately 100% already. So um, in Ethiopia, um, liberalization is desperately needed simply to get more phones into the hands of more people and realize the economic benefits. Um, here, the phones are already out there, but they could be cheaper, and there could be more um, options, there could be more services that are available elsewhere. And so liberalization, I think, um, should bring down the price um, uh, Two operators is the, really is the minimum. I mean, you, uh, you really want to have three. three. <laughs> you really want to have three or four. So we did the same in Britain, though. We had um, we had Monopoly, and then I think it was Vodafone that was the competitor. And Vodafone has a very good track record of shaking up the um, the mobile market wherever they go. So um, I would expect to see um, prices falling, um, and uh, 
That's what I would so that's what I'd want to hear. How does how does Vodafone expect to do that, and what new services they're going to introduce? On um, on broadband, it's uh, it's a matter of actually getting um, access out there, and so that is the the field where the metric to be looking at is the penetration of broadband connections, uh, the average speed, um, and so on. So um, those are the uh, those are the things that ought to improve if you have competition. And in other countries, they have. So um, that's that's what should happen here. Are there any stories that you think journalists, you know, on your broader, deeper coverage, that journalists should be looking for as they start to cover the liberalization of the markets? March is when we're going to see our first offer. Are there stories that should be looking for that are a little bit deeper? Well, there is a, uh, an enormous um, and long-running debate about the best way to introduce competition. Um, and essentially, um, you could go along the route of saying that competitors have to build their own network completely. Or you could say that the incumbent monopoly provider has to share part or all of their network. And I'm not sure which approach has been taken in Qatar, but there is a, um, essentially there is a big debate about which of those approaches is better. Um, we have come up with, with the, um, probably the most elaborate solution in Britain, um, which is expected to be adopted elsewhere in Europe. Um, and it's where you actually separate the uh, monopoly incumbent into two pieces and you get one of them to run the wholesale network and, and so on. Um, we don't really know if this is working or not, but the, I think the point is that whatever model has been chosen here, you can look to other parts of the world where the same model has been adopted for a good idea of how it should play out. And if it's not going as well as you expect, then maybe you should be considering other models and maybe you should be pointing out that in this country where this model was introduced, things have worked better. So I think that's the sort of role that um, the technology journalists can play. And that very often happens in America, for example, where um, it is a common complaint in the, in the newspapers that America is falling behind in broadband and they point to Japan and they point to South Korea and even parts of Europe and say, why is it that we are, we are falling behind? And they're constantly pointing out the successes that other countries have had. And so really, I think that's, um, that's the important role that the journalists can play. Do we have any questions from the audience? So, I will to you about the question of 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 the question الداخلين أو العاملين في هذا القطاع في قطاع الصحافة التكنولوجيا أصبحوا من أنصاف الصحفيين وأرباع المثقفين وبالتالي بدأنا نلحظ يعني أننا في حالة في موج ومد كبير من هذا النوع من الصحافة وبالتالي مما انعكس على مهنية الإعلام بشكل عام وبالتالي إلى انخفاض المهنية بشكل عام فيما يخص الصحافة الإلكترونية ألا تشاركني هذا الرأي؟ Well the next session is going to talk about the um the role of, uh, of citizen journalism, which um, it has to be said, some people regard as a way of cutting costs, but has the great benefit of bringing many more voices into the field. But I think that's a rather um, different discussion from the field of technology journalism, um, in the sense that that is about the impact of technology on the practice of other kinds of journalism, of political, of news journalism. Um, and I think in the, in the field of tech coverage itself, um, it's really a matter of analysis, and that's something that um, you, you need the views of people who are close to the subject, but you, you also need the expertise in the subject. Um, so I think that's a rather uh, different state of affairs, and I, I don't think that, um, that citizen journalism will replace the need for analysis and um, coverage of, of regulation and so on. I don't see people clamoring to offer um, coverage of those subjects uh, within citizen journalism. Let's take a question uh, first from the, the crowd, a student at Carnegie Mellon. We have numerous students in the room. What would you advise students who are considering technology journalism as a career in terms of their academics and also extracurricular activities as they prepare for a career in journalism? Um, I would say that you need to have a uh, grounding academically in the 
in the actual technology um, and in the, in the physical sciences. I mean, I did engineering at Oxford, which has been extremely useful. Um, and many of my colleagues at The Economist were sort of trained as biologists or, uh, by and large, they actually studied science at university. Um, in Britain, it's slightly unusual because we, um, we tend not to um, value formal qualifications in journalism very highly. Um, it's different in other parts of the world. In America, um, most journalists will do some sort of postgraduate study, but I think it's very important that um, that, that comes on top of a formal training in the technolo technological subjects, because um, it's very hard to pick that stuff up later. Um, so my advice would be to, um, to actually study something like that first, and then move from that sideways. The journalism is easier to learn than the science, basically. Um, that would be the first thing. And the other thing is just to, um, I mean, I was involved with student newspapers and so on at Oxford, and uh, they really are a useful learning experience, and you can then move on to internships at publications like The Economist or sort of newspapers. Are you offering internships? Uh, well, we do, we, I'm, I'm not all of them, I'm afraid, but we do have several internship programs that we, we uh, they're a very valuable source of um, uh, employees for us, we very often subsequently hire interns. And in order to evaluate somebody at that stage in their career, you want cuttings, and that means very often cuttings from student publications. So um, that's very important to have done that. And very often they're already freelancing for other publications too. It's never too early to start doing that. Great. Any questions from the audience? All right, now that's you first. Microphone to the front row. Thank you for your informative uh, lecture. Uh, you mentioned that the internet will not make peace in this world. I agree with you. The, the internet itself will not make peace. But the user of the internet can make a lot of things with it. My question is, what, is, what are the qualifications to be a technology journalist? Technology made of what? Thank you. Cool. What are the qualifications to be a technology journalist that you must have to be an effective technology journalist? Well, I think you need to you need to understand the subject, um, and you need to be able to, on the one hand, you need to bridge the gap between um, the interested reader who is not an expert and the experts. And I think that the art is to explain things in a way that. Um, the general public can understand, but that does not offend the experts. So you don't misuse the terminology uh, and so on. I mean, for example, there are very technical definitions of words like power and energy. They mean different, and force, they mean different things. And um, if you are trained as a scientist, you know that, and you can then write an explanation that is comprehensible to somebody about how something works that doesn't. Um, have the scientists who have done the work frowning and, and tut tutting. And I think, I think that is ultimately the qualification you need. Now, some people will get that. Um, some people are, are able to do that, and some people learn to do it, and some people are trained to do it. But really, how you get there doesn't matter. I think our role is to bridge the, um, the technical, the difficult subjects, whether it's regulation or, um, or actually the, how the technology works with the general public who will be the users and the consumers and the voters or whatever who, who decide what spreads. So I think that's the most important qualification, being able to bridge the gap. Okay. Yeah, you got a question? Uh, Tom, you um, talked about access to technology in developing nations, uh, in particular mobile phones. Um, what's your view on um, the movement in some countries, in developing countries, for the access to computers, so the low-cost computers, the hundred-dollar computer, as as they call it? Um, do you see that as as something that can really take hold, or perhaps my view of it is, well, it's one thing to give them a hundred-dollar computer; you've got to connect it to something interesting and to something useful. Do you? Where do you see that movement heading? Um, I am very skeptical about the hundred-dollar laptop. Not because I, um, because I, I, clearly um, mobile phones are the first step, and access to the internet through more advanced devices with bigger screens is 
what comes later. But the $100 laptop project in particular is engineers trying to solve a problem that is not an engineering problem. Um, a carpet bombing Africa with computers is not going to make much difference. You can't use a computer if you can't read. Um, and you can't use it if you haven't got electricity or if you haven't got the rule of law. And the shortage of computers in Africa and other developing nations is a symptom of other things. It's, it's, um, so the, the people behind that particular project are disciples of a philosopher called Seymour Papert. And he believes that if you give people computers, they don't need teachers. And um, I just think this is nonsense. I think you need teachers, and you need schools, and you need books. And later on, you can do the computers, but just to, to try and short-circuit development by doing lots of computers is just silly. So um, the great thing about phones, mobile phones, is that they spread on their own. They already cost less than $100. They cost $20, the cheapest ones. Um, and they have very clear benefits. And in fact, you don't even need to be able to read and write to use one. Um, so in parts of the world, there are text message interpreters who will send and receive a message for you. So they can read and write. Um, and of course, to talk on the phone, you don't need to be able to, to read and write. So um, I just think the phone is the technology with the greatest potential to advance development. And once people um, are wealthier, they can start to do things like buy computers. The other funny thing about the $100 laptop is that it, the project has failed. Um, they basically shut it down this month. Um, but it sort of succeeded because it forced other, it encouraged other companies to make very cheap laptops. And these very cheap laptops, the netbooks, are now the fastest growing part of the, um, of the market. And um, people are buying them uh, they cost a bit more than $100, but they're spreading on their own through market forces. You don't need to have people from MIT telling you how to do things. The market can do this. Great. We're just going to take one more question, and I'm going to take it from the audience. But sorry that we're running out of time. But don't worry. If you didn't get to ask your question, we're going to, Tom's going to join us for lunch, and we'll also have a coffee break where you can ask your question directly of them. This question uh, comes from one of the PR professionals in our room. We have a number of them here. What do you think the relationship between PR professionals and the media is going to be like, considering the new trends and emerging technology, especially things like the media? Yeah. I remember I read a debate online saying, will, um, will blogging kill PR, or will PR kill blogging? Um, I'm not sure either of those is true, but I think um, the role for um, PRs to connect companies to journalists is less um, important than it used to be in the sense that you can find companies and contact them directly much more easily. Um, so I, I think it's uh, a challenge for the PR community to decide what that means they're really there for. Um, and uh, as I say, the best companies are those who um, acknowledge that Yes, they are trying to put forward the view of a particular company, but that view is much more credible if it is framed in the context of what else is going on in the same field. Um, so the PRs that I have the greatest respect for are those who are you know, not afraid to admit that. But it's a, I think it's a difficult time for, for PRs, and it's, um, uh, you know, I'm very pleased that it's not my, um, it's not my uh, job to make their lives easier because their lives are getting harder. I, the PRs often say to me, what can you, how can we get stories into the economies? You know, we, we don't say what our future stories are going to be, for example, which makes it very difficult for them. And they say that makes our lives very difficult. And I say, well, I'm sorry, it's not my job to make your life easy. It's my job to do the best coverage that we can. So um, it's, I think they face a challenge at the moment. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you.